listening to Mr. Radio, and I'm your host, Marshall. Today's guest has emerged in the music industry as the torchbearer of the true spirit of American roots music. A seasoned live performer, prolific recording artist, and versatile multi-instrumentalist who plays the Hammond B3 organ, piano, keyboards, accordion, and sings vocals. He also wears the hat of an award-winning recording producer and engineer, capturing the talents of some of the world's most highly acclaimed musicians, among them Rick Danko, Garth Hudson, New Riders of the Purple Sage, Jesse McReynolds, Buckwheat Zydeco, Commander Cody, and of course, the band. Grammy nominated and inducted into the New York State Blues Hall of Fame, he also holds a permanent place in the Canada South Blues Museum. It is my honor to introduce today's guest, Professor Louis. Uh, may I call you Professor Louis? You certainly can, Marshall, and thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> well, thank you for being my guest. Just curious, how did you first discover your talent for music? Well, the first uh, way it really came back when I grew up in a little, t a little city called Peekskill right outside of New York City. And they had a fantastic music teacher there, Vinnie Corazine. And in the school system itself, uh, it was a lot of musicians. And they started us off at a young age learning music and finding interest in music. So it really started way back in elementary school so all the way through uh, high school because of the teachers. And <laughs> did you move away from Peekskill or did you stay in that uh, vicinity? Well, when uh, we were young, we used to go down and play in New York City, you know, even when we were in high school. And eventually I ended up moving to New York City, and then from there moved uh, around the country and ended up in Woodstock, New York. So I didn't live in Peekskill past the age of about 16 or 17. So going to New York City, you must have been influenced by a lot of musicians. How did living and working in New York City influence you? Well, at that time, New York City was uh, it was soul music. And there were a lot of places to play where you played six, seven nights a week, actually, two sets a night from nine to four. And there were a lot, lots of bands all around the Manhattan area, especially around the Times Square area. So you really got a good history of uh, right at that point in time, besides the school backing I had, a lot of soul music. And you got a chance to really play a lot and um, learn your trade and see a lot of younger musicians my age and older musicians because we're working and musicians were coming through town and through the city a lot. So that was a good start right at that time. So were you trained in school, or did you just pick this up by ear? Well, there was only so much training you would get in school. Luckily, you know, the kids in Peekskill, a lot of them went on to be professional musicians, so it was a little bit of both, because it wasn't like going to study at a conservatory, because it was a regular public high school. But they did give special attention to music and did get special attention, especially the kind of music that we play, rock and roll and blues and roots gospel music, uh, that mostly came from ear and listening to records. You know, you used to do a lot of listening to records and try to imitate the records and uh, pick up all the licks you could. We opened the show with Love Bound, which was from the album Miles of Blues, and it was reviewed, the, the album was reviewed by Blues Doodles, and they said it had a great riff that Miss Marie brings a soulful vocal that works well with, essentially, a blues rock song. The guitar solos are inventive and varied and use all six strings and 21 frets, showing that there is more to soloing than high bends. Can you tell us a little more about the musicians on that track? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, that's the Chromatics, which have been together now for close to 20 years. Miss Marie has been with me actually since a lot of those New York early days, and she's a fantastic writer and singer, as a, as a great blues and soul singer. The guitar player, John Platani, and I, when we grew up around that peak school area, all the other towns and cities also had a lot of bands, and they used to uh, have Battle of the Bands and things like that, and we all got to meet each other. And John Platania, the guitar player with the Chromatics, he came from a small town called Highland, which was maybe a half hour north of Peekskill, and went to different schools, and we got to meet each other when we were in high school. He went on to play with Van Morrison and write all the great guitar licks for Van Morrison, He's the guitar player on the on the record, and as they say, he's been with us uh, a recording for 20 years, and he's been on the road with us for the last 10. So we've been good friends. So he's he's one of the greatest guitar players out there. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you listen to uh, Moon Dance or Domino; those are all the licks that he wrote, which we all grew up with. You know, when we were young kids, he wrote them. 
the drummer Gary Burke. He's the drummer that uh, was with Bob Dylan in the Rolling Thunder Review and the great Joe Jackson records. Frank Campbell, the bass player, was Levon Helm's music director for the Woodstock All-Stars. And we all live around Woodstock, that's the thing. Since the Chromatics are a favorite band up here and around the country, we got work. We hit the road about 20 years ago. Actually, a little earlier than that, we were Rick Danko, originally Rick Danko's backup band, and when Rick passed, we decided to go out to go out on our own. So that's, that's who you're listening to when you're listening to that record. So talking about the area that you live in and the band and... Big Pink, I tried to find Big Pink once. I was never able to find it. But yeah, yeah. you were an engineer on their uh, albums, their last albums. And you also earned your moniker of Professor Louie. How did that come about? Well, first of all, besides engineering the band records, I produced them or co-produced them you know, with the guys. And uh, uh, the first one, Jericho, with John Simon, was involved for a little while. And I uh, became very good friends with the guys at one point, you know, mu- uh, music friends. And Rick Danko and I became the closest in the end. Rick Danko and I became the closest. And we started going out when the band was, wasn't working or Levon Helm got a movie role or something like that. Rick always wanted to go out and play and needed a, a partner. And he had this fellow Shredney, a harp player that was with him for a long time, very good harp player, good guy. And Shredney had a, a Down syndrome son and decided it would be better to stay home and raise his son in respect to Shredney. And so Rick asked me to go on the road with him. Now, the band's sort of an interesting uh, guys because we all sort of had a lot of very similar backgrounds where they were, they were a dance band also in New York City called the Hawks at one point. And so we sort of had a similar background, even though they were older than I was. What they did for fun was they called each other by their middle names, you know, Mark Levon Helm and Jamie, Ro- Ro- Jamie Robbie Robertson and all that. So when I got friendly enough with the guys in the band out of respect, they started calling me by my middle name, which is Louie. With Rick, when we would be hitting the road, since I was engineering, producing, arranging, and doing whatever I had to do to make the band happen, because they were fantastic musicians and it was an honor to uh, play and work with them, he just started calling me Professor Louie, like a lot of other, not to compare myself with all the other keyboard players, but, you know, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Dr. John, they all seem to... Uh, get uh, Professor Long here. They all seem to get those kind of monikers, and Rick and Fun on stage started calling me Professor Louie. That when we go to do TV shows and radio shows, he'd always go say, take it, Professor Louie. So the name sort of got, you know, validated by Rick Danko. Well, Professor Louie, I have a question since we're talking about the band. Yeah. I'd like to play Too Soon Gone. Could you introduce that okay. track for us? All right. Well, Too Soon Gone is an interesting track because it originally started... When uh, the band, when I was with the band, before we had a record deal, after 17 years of the, after the last waltz, when the band regrouped around 83, 84, they'd asked me to come on and sort of help them put things together. They got a record deal with Columbia Records at the time, and they were assigning different writers to come up and write with the band. One of those writers was Jules Shear, and Jules came up, and Stan Celeste, who was the keyboard player, yeah, who replaced Richard Manuel at the time, after Richard passed. Stan and uh, Jules wrote this song in honor of uh, Richard Manuel, and they called it Too Soon Gone. W- when we went to go do the Jericho record, I recorded Rick singing it with the band Too Soon Gone. And then uh, maybe 20, or maybe, uh, yeah, maybe 20 years later, we got a call from Jules' manager, who still owned the rights to Too Soon Gone, and asked Professor Louie and the Chromatics to also record it so he could help us promote the uh, record. So we recorded, uh, Professor Louie and the Chromatics also recorded Too Soon Gone. So I'm not too sure, did I send you the Chromatics version or the band version? Uh, I'm about to play the Chromatics version. And uh, All right, well, uh, that's even better. Okay, so <laughs> let's take a listen to Too Soon Gone. All right. Some 
mistake Just a little too late Like you're missing something now That you never knew you had So how do I answer These blues you say I've got That was Too Soon Gone, performed by my guest, Professor Louie in the Chromatics. Before we started the show, you asked me where you could hear this show, and I said on iTunes. And unfortunately, on iTunes, I have this listed as a clean show. Because of that, I really couldn't play the fugs, but I believe your career crossed their <laughs> path. What, what was your involvement with the fugs? Well, I want to thank you for playing Too Soon Gone, because... Being that I was there when the song was first being written and everything, it means a lot. So thanks, Marshall, for playing that one. I really do appreciate it. But with the Fugs now, we, uh, the Fugs uh, were, of course, one of our favorite all-time groups when we were younger because, you know, they were in that protest mode and broke a lot of rules. And they had very good musicianship, by the way. The Fugs were interesting. And they were a Lower East Side New York poetry band with very, very smart guys. Ed Sanders lives in Woodstock. Ed used to come down to the studio that I used to work in there, uh, which now I, I own, I run LRS, and Ed would come down and do some of his poetry and some of his readings, and then eventually started bringing Thule Kuffelberg from the Fugs and some of the other guys and started making new Fugs records here and taking some of the old records, re remastering them and making them more palatable for the for the new markets because when they were originally making records it was all vinyls and then it became cassettes then it became cds and then downloads so i became very good friends with ed and i worked with him a lot including the guy who owned the studio at that point so i became good friends and made a lot of records and redid i think their whole old catalog remastered it for uh cds or a lot of them anyway so so we became friends with the fugs and uh had nice experiences with them very smart guys, very good guys, and they're very satirical. I'm glad that your response will pass the clean test for iTunes podcasts. Yeah, well, they did have a few cleans, but they were always on the protest world. And, uh, 
they had some pretty pretty funny songs about things. Yeah, that's that was one. That's one of the problems these days with censorship. You got to watch out what you say because they they will pull it down on you. I just want to talk about a review that one of your tracks had in Don and Cheryl's Blues Blog, and they uh, called your funky steampunk blues stone cold grunge. I'd like to play steampunk blues, but would you like to introduce it for us? Well, funky steampunk, we got the idea a few years ago, you know, traveling around. We always see different, and we play festivals and all kinds of festivals around the country, and we started seeing a lot of different fashions that had that Mad Max look, uh, you know, Mad Max, the movie look. And I still, we started inquiring about it, and they saw all that steampunk fashions. And then when we traveled to Italy and Venice, there was really a lot of it, and I said, you know, it's... It's a funky look. We should uh, write a song, Funky Steampunk Blues, because it's a fun title, and we should make it a funky song. And that's how it came about. We jets. It was a jam we did in the studio. We put some words to it. And uh, oh, also, um, there's some pretty funny things in some diners we went to. There was a um, there was a, 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 on the menu a dinner called or a, a breakfast called Graveyard Stew. And that got me thinking about lyrics, so that uh, that lyric sort of play. And it turns out there was actually a dish called Graveyard Stew that you wouldn't want to necessarily eat. It was for hangovers. So therefore, we uh, put that lyric in there and uh, became funky steampunk blues. With all we went and looked at all the fashions and wrote a lot about the fashions and how that whole that it looks. And Amaru, the uh, part in the middle, the hook, that is the capital of the steampunk art uh, work. It's a museum in New Zealand, and the name of the city is Amaru. Let's take a listen to Steampunk Blues.
funky steampunk blues bass. That was Funky Steampunk Blues, performed by my guest, Professor Louie in the Chromatics. You know, even though you uh, warned against doing this, I, I think I'd like to try some of that uh, gravy stuff there, that graveyard gravy. Yeah, you gravy. can do it. Uh, I think it's like bread and hot milk in a bowl. I'm not <laughs> it doesn't sound too <laughs> bad. On a hangover, a, it supposedly works. Or on a cold day. I'm, yeah. I'm amazed at how many musicians that I've spoken to are also teaching, including you. How have you been involved in teaching? Well, I joined an org. Well, I've been part of an organization for a long time called Common Ground on the Hill, down in Maryland at McDaniel College. They have more well, now. It's more, but when I first joined them, they had two weeks in the summer where you can go to the campus there and study all kinds of different instruments and arts. You know, fine arts, languages, human uh, nature. And they had a, a very big staff. The fellow who's the head of it is Walt Michael, and he's a hammer dulcimer player. And I was on a gig playing blues with Guy Davis, the blues player. Guy was part of Common Ground and asked Walt to come and sit in on uh, Dobro, because, you know, Walt Michael's a very, very good musician. And Walt said to me, well, I'm not really that versed in blues. Maybe you could help me. And I started helping him. He goes, you know, you'd be good for my organization called Common Ground. I went down there for a week. Because, uh, you know, it's, uh, you go for a week at a time or two weeks at a time, and they have a festival, and you teach all day at the college. And I really enjoyed that particular experience, and I got uh, interested because Walt Michael gave me the opportunity to uh, start teaching, and now I've done it 10, 12 years in a row. I just teach for like one week a year, maybe two weeks a year at that point because, uh, you know, our schedule doesn't allow a steady teaching schedule. Although I have to say, up here where we are in Woodstock, when I could, I always did a mentoring program with the Antiora School, which is the public school up here, and I did that for about 30 years. But that was off and on one or two days a month. So that's how I got started teaching a little more uh, disciplined when I went to Common Ground. And the organization still exists. You can look it up called commongroundonthehill.org. It's one of the best organizations in the country. Well, I'm sure your students must be very lucky <laughs> to have you as a teacher. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. There's uh, different courses that we teach, and uh, people from all over the world come there. About a year ago, you had a documentary, Music from Hurley Mountain, and it was published by Woodstock Records. Can you tell us about it and how our listeners can purchase it? Well, thanks for asking about that. We wrote, a couple years ago, we wrote a whole record about the history of where we are, Hurley, New York, Ulster County, because there's a lot of history here, starting back before the way before the Revolutionary War, this was a big farming area for the Indians. The colonists came, and then the Revolutionary War came. It became the waterways for New York City, the uh, reservoirs for New York City. So we wrote a whole record tracing a lot of that history. A uh, director from that works a lot for PBS heard the record as a fan and asked us if he could ma make a documentary of the record interviewing you know, Heritage Society people and people from this area. So we worked with them for about six years, putting it together, and it just actually was released last week as the Music from Hurley Mountain documentary. It's a DVD that you can get on WoodstockRecords.com, which is nice. You go to WoodstockRecords.com, and you can purchase the DVD. Or if you'd like to stream or rent the DVD or the documentary, you can go to Amazon Prime. And you can uh, rent it or stream it, and you can even buy it from there. It's working out really well. We haven't really got into the whole promotion of it yet because of the uh, quarantine a little bit, but we will. And as I said, the DVD just got reproduced beginning of December. Well, I hope that our listeners will go to the site and get a copy of it. You know, occasionally... Well, it'll be great because it is, re it is really interesting. It's, re it's true 
Americana town history. It truly is. I'm sure you're going to get some people checking it out. We're, I hope so. Marshall, we're yeah. sort of running out of time, but I okay. drive through Columbia County every once in a while. I know that's on the other side of the oh, river okay. from you. Yeah. I'll pick up WKZE-FM, and I'll hear Professor Louis Woodstock Rock and Review. Is that still going? Oh, yeah, yeah. We do that every week, every Saturday. It's on from 5 to 7, and, you know, we, we pre-record it because we have to. Well, now I don't have to, but we still do because we were on the road. Sometimes I was doing them from where we were traveling from, pre-recording them and sending them in. So, yeah, I'd like to keep that going as long as I can, and it was great WKZ gave me that opportunity to have a show, and we archive the shows. You can find them archived on ProfessorLouis.com. You go there, and on the front page, you hit the button, you can see all the archived shows, hear all the archived shows. And I like to keep it going as long as, as, long as I can because I am playing things that you don't usually hear on the radio. And it variations, and it's not specifically the one genre. There's just so many great musicians up here in Woodstock. Genres get covered, jazz, classical, the roots music, the blues music, rock and roll, uh, folk music. And so it gives me a wide scope. And uh, also everything is what's all music comes down to the Woodstock uh, philosophy, and that is everything works as long as it's quality music. So yes, it's still going. Appreciate you bringing that up. We only have a minute, so you've only got a minute okay. to do this, but what are your okay. what are your next projects that you have coming up in the future? Well, we've been doing a lot of stream. We've been performing a lot of streaming shows, and the next one coming up is uh, the end of the year. We do a Rick Danko birthday bash, which we've done 20 years in a row with the Woodstock Horn. So it's a 10-piece band with Larry Packer on violin. And it's Professor Louis Necromatics playing songs of Rick Danko, and it's coming from the Bear, it's streaming from the Bearsville Theater on Tuesday, if you want me to leave the date, Tuesday, December 29th at 8 o'clock. But they are selling tickets, so you have to go to bearsvilletheater.com and pick up a ticket. But anyway, that's a really nice project, and it's really the first time. It's one thing about the streaming shows that have been happy about is that we're it's all being documented on film we had bobby kaminsky who's a, a very good director direct the film hopefully it'll carry on from there so we recorded about an hour and a half of only rick danko's uh, hits and the band hits that that he was part of and parts of stuff that i produced and so it, i'm really sort of proud of that so that's that's what's on the agenda right now this friday night we're uh on cbs six playing uh, melodies of Melody of Peace, one of our original pieces with the New York State Symphony and our choir. It's 200 pieces. That's going to be on television New Year's, uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's Day. And uh, that's raised millions of dollars for the Albany Medical Children's Ward. So we have some very nice things going on that bring a lot back to the neighborhood. Professor Louie, I'm so happy that you were able to take the time to speak with me. I'd like to come full circle and close with open hand open heart. Great. Again, thank you for being my guest, and I hope to hear from you again real soon. Well, Marshall, stay in touch with me anytime you want. We're, we're hard to get rid of once you know us. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Mr. Radio, and I'm your host, Marshall. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Mr. Radio. Your hand.